a little bit of background. Um, uh, Celestine is a doctoral candidate here in politics and international relations. Uh, and has been focusing on uh, political participation among young uh, migrant, refugee, and low socioeconomic um, voters in New Zealand and Sweden. And of course, that is uh, at least some of the material that we'll be hearing about today. As has been suggested already, quite relevant, given we've just uh, in the last six months been through an election. Uh, so the question of political participation, I think, is uh, very significant and obviously significant also in a co global context uh, where we uh, need to think about questions of um, diverse political participation in relation to nationalism and increased sort of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, parochial and xenophobic responses to diversity that we see in uh, some parts of the world. Uh, so that's all I will say to get things going. Um, I will hand it over to Celestina to um, uh, take us away and um, hopefully you know, uh, following your presentation, we'll have time for some discussion as well. About 30, 40 minutes or? Uh, yeah, 25 minutes. 25 minutes, perfect, that's, that's great, yeah. Uh, so, hello everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, like Francis said, I'm, uh, my name is Celestina, I'm a PhD student about to submit in three months. Uh, so that's exciting. And I, I will be talking about uh, barriers to political participation among migrants in New Zealand and Sweden. And this is... Uh, mm -hmm. They don't. I can't hear anything now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Neither can we. Oh, okay. And I've lost the view as well. Have you? No, I can still see, but I can't. Okay. Hear <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I, yeah. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Yes. Ah, yes. Yeah, okay. okay. I, I will I will start over. Not sure why that happened, folks. <laughs> I can't see the presentation anymore, but that might have been me. <laughs> Does everyone else see the presentation? Hands up? Yep. Yes. See not the nods. Uh, okay. Okay, I'll listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I just uh, 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 I'll just say a few words about participants. So uh, uh, participants were migrants who are not from high income democracies. So mostly from either democracies that don't uh, work uh, the same way as in New Zealand or non-democratic countries. Uh, and uh, participants have been in the host country, New Zealand or Sweden at least five years, uh, have, have the right to vote. And I also, I did not use interpreters. So there was no language barrier, which is important because being in a new country, having just arrived and being uh, un uninformed, uh, not being able to understand the political discourse, these are obviously uh, barriers to political participation, but this research goes beyond that and looks at people uh, who have overcome these, these two barriers and uh, what, what other barriers remain after that. Uh, and when, when I say political participation, I'm focusing mostly on voting because this is the easiest and lowest cost way of participating. But uh, some of my participants also uh, participated in other ways, including uh, being members of political parties or participating in protests. Uh, but uh, this presentation will, uh, will focus on, on voting because this was uh, an experience that most participants had. And you're welcome to ask questions about these other forms of participation uh, later. Uh, so, um, no. again, I cannot... Just click once, maybe double. Uh, change that. 
so I, I purposely sampled participants for richness and diversity of perspectives. So there are a lot of different uh, ethnicities uh, represented here. But at the same time, this is, this is a small sample. Uh, this was exploratory research to identify causal mechanisms to provide a starting point for the next stage of research. So I cannot generalize based on, on this data. And I am aware of that, but I, I think this data uncovers some mechanisms that really deserve further investigation with, with other methods. Um, okay, so um, before we start talking about data, so why, why compare New Zealand and Sweden? Uh, and uh, New Zealand and Sweden are most different cases when it comes to migration, and they had similar migration policies up to uh, the, the 70s, the 1970s, which was uh, low-skilled labor uh, to fill in gaps uh, um, in, in manufacturing. Uh, but when it comes to recent migration, uh, the policy pathways diverged very sharply. Uh, and uh, Sweden uh, focused on uh, humanitarian migration, uh, uh, former refugees, asylum seekers, and family unification. And New Zealand, as you all know, focuses on skilled and business migrants. There is a humanitarian stream, but it is relatively uh, small. Uh, and a lot of uh, other policy settings follow from this difference. For example, migrants to Sweden are seen uh, in the policy discourse as people uh, who are in need of help. So there are extensive post-settlement services and some of these services are mandatory. Uh, whereas in New Zealand, uh, migrants are seen as rich in human and economic capital, so they don't require much help. And uh, there, there's little in terms of uh, post-settlement support, uh, with the exception of refugees who are not, uh, not the focus of uh, New Zealand uh, migration policy. Uh, and uh, so migrants are mostly just left on their own. And uh, even, even the prepaid English classes, some of them have to uh, by uh, as a condition for immigrating, uh, participation is not enforced and the update is about one third, that was the last uh, Ministry of Education data. Um, uh, so um, here are the main themes that came up uh, and uh, I will now uh, discuss this theme, these themes and there will be some quotes uh, on, on the screen and I will be commenting uh, on these. Okay, so uh, can, can, you, can you see the whole slide? Uh, okay. So uh, belonging was, uh, was a very strong theme that came, came up for most participants. Uh, and uh, voting was for them something that reflects the belonging, the integration, and also a way to construct it. Uh, so some participants voted, like, like this participant I'm citing here, to be like other people, no different. Uh, and I also had uh, cases of participants who admitted they voted randomly, uh, not knowing anything about parties, just doing a random tick, just, just enthusiastically wanting to participate in the civic ritual. And uh, there was this quote on the title slide, you have the emotion of queeriness when you vote. So looking for this emotion of queeriness. Uh, and uh, I, I think this data presents support for using voter turnout of migrants as one of the measures of integration as, as many policy frameworks do. Uh, and. Um, among New Zealand participants, uh, these feelings of belonging, belonging were positive or at, at the very worst neutral. So some participants said that they just live here because it's more convenient, but they choose to remain a part of their home country. So, so they were engaged only economically and not, not in other ways, but that there were no negative feelings uh, about New Zealand among participants. And uh, that was in stark contrast to Sweden, uh, where many participants pointed to the lack of feeling uh, of belonging. And uh, the, the reasons are interesting because participants were very aware of the policy discourse that's happening uh, around them, not just in the media, but also the official policy discourse. Uh, so they pointed to uh, the long waiting time for voting rights, uh, like this uh, participant, the, the first quote over here, uh, being left out of economic opportunities. So here we have one participant saying that 
if, if you don't have work, there isn't anything for you to participate in because you're already excluded. So what, what is the point? Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's interesting how voting is here for, for participants embedded in this larger notion of relationship with the host country and, and the host society. Uh, and uh, this relationship with the state was uh, commented on by another, uh, another participant. Uh, sorry, we've got a technical uh, issue here. Uh, and uh, here, this participant, he draws attention to the disempowered position of an asylum seeker is in. Uh, so the asylum seeker is a person in need and it's hard to take a step from this mindset uh, to a mindset where you are the person in power, you are participating politically, you are making decisions. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, reflects uh, the hypothesis of sources, uh, interactions with other state agencies can uh, affect feelings of political efficacy, which then gets transferred to voting. And uh, uh, among Swedish participants, that was very much uh, visible, and many of them enter the country as clients of the welfare system, which is nicer than the New Zealand welfare system, but it's not uh, as... Uh, uh, as good as, as it used to be, because in, in Sweden there were also cuts, uh, welfare benefit cuts, and uh, some, some of uh, welfare delivery is quite invasive in terms of uh, the level of surveillance uh, uh, recipients are subject to. Uh, so so uh, in, in the case, uh, so we've got the citizenship and migration process, uh, and another site where this uh, construction of belonging is happening in Sweden are social studies classes uh, and uh, these are uh, part of the integration program which also offers language classes and it's compulsory for migrants who receive social assistance so non-participation in these classes can result in benefit cuts uh, and uh, th there are several papers that comment on the curriculum uh, and textbooks in which participants are often described in terms of deficiencies and people who are not in paid employment are uh, stigmatized. And uh, uh, on, on, one, on one hand, uh, the content on Swedish society in these courses is uh, very rudimentary, like how does it work when someone buys something? Uh, so, so there's this assumption that migrants are uneducated or undereducated, uh, which, uh, uh, which is not consistent with empirical evidence, but uh, uh, migrants, uh, the, my participants, they, they, they said that they, they, they feel uh, uh, stereotyped as stupid and uneducated. So, so this is an additional uh, uh, source of those feelings of this, this empowerment. Uh, and also the... Uh, and that the whole Swedish integration system frames newcomers as uh, people who cannot offer anything to the host society but need a lot, a lot of work before they can uh, even start looking for work before they can contribute. And of course, this contrast with New Zealand where migrants are selected on their human capital and also because uh, the economic migrants we are talking about, they're not refugees. If they are not successful, they can uh, go back to their home countries, which is not an option for refugees. So, so uh, this economic integration was, uh, was a positive aspect of most of uh, the New Zealand participants. And uh, finally, the, the, the uh, that's, I, I, will, I think I will come back to this slide later. Uh, and finally, the third component of belonging uh, was language. And I, I mentioned that my participants were able to talk without an interpreter. Uh, so the issue of language was not uh, uh, relevant to their understanding the instructions about voting. Uh, but they still wanted to see the native languages used in official documents, such as enrollment forms, uh, uh, ballot papers, the Electoral Commission website, and here, uh, in this quote here, one participant explains that seeing an advertisement in her own language makes her feel different uh, than seeing the same advertisement uh, in English, because she 
uh, fields included. And uh, uh, a major theme uh, in both New Zealand and in Sweden was that participants did not feel invited. They were not sure if they ought to vote. They, they had this legal right to vote, but uh, they were not sure if being, being new and not being born here, have they got this moral rights to participate and they need, they had this need to feel uh, invited and using uh, native languages uh, in, in the process, uh, in the process of voting was uh, one of the ways to send a clear signal that yes, we want you, we want people like you to participate. Yes, you are expected to vote, you are invited to vote. Uh, and Similarly, in, in New Zealand, some uh, migrant participants expressed disappointment that politicians didn't seek out their votes. Uh, and uh, there was one uh, very, uh, uh, very strange uh, narrative from one of the participants who spoke with nostalgia about voter intimidation she, uh, she experienced in her home country. Because for her, this intimidation meant that her vote was important for someone. Mm -hmm. Uh, that her vote was wanted and here no, no one cares whether she votes or not and politicians don't come to you, you have to go to them. Uh, so, uh, so people don't feel that their votes are valued by, by someone. So that was, uh, that was belonging and the second major theme was surprising, it was fear. Uh, and uh, it was surprising because New Zealand and Sweden are countries with very good human, right, uh, human rights records. Uh, they're among the least corrupt countries in the world and uh, the electoral integrity uh, is pretty much unquestioned. Uh, but uh, for a fair number of participants, uh, fear was a major barrier to voting. And, and there were two kinds of this fear. So one was a fear of politics. Uh, a belief that engaging in politics is dangerous and can negatively affect your chances of success. And this was back for many participants when I inquired what exactly they mean. Like, okay, maybe employment, maybe, you know, the immigration of family members. Uh, and this was, this was linked to a belief that the vote is not secret. And in New Zealand, uh, ballot papers are individually numbered. It used to be a number, now it's a barcode. And indeed, there is a mechanism for tracing the votes to a person. And this, uh, this uh, makes it possible to not require voter identification like many other countries do. And of course, uh, there are uh, procedures in place to ensure secrecy, but when, when people from authoritarian countries come in and see uh, that they sign next to, uh, next to a barcode and they have a similar barcode on the ballot paper, uh, it's, it's immediately obvious to them, okay, my vote is not secret, uh, so I, I, I need to vote for the government or it's, it's better not to vote because, you know, someone may, be, may not be happy like this uh, participant here said. And uh, also a, a number of participants um, uh, saw voting as something that is by definition against the government, uh, an expression of ingratitude. So, so uh, I came to this country, uh, I, I was let in uh, as an asylum seeker, or, or I came, was allowed to come as an economic migrant, and I'm in, in a better situation than I was before, so it would be ungrateful of me to uh, uh, complain, to criticize the government, and participation in politics is seen uh, for, by some of these participants uh, that, uh, as, as uh, this expression of uh, uh, unhappiness. And these were exclusively participants from authoritarian countries, uh, like none of the participants from, uh, uh, from India or uh, uh, Mexico uh, had those sorts of ideas. So in, in New Zealand, these were predominantly um, uh, some of the Chinese participants. Uh, and uh, here, here's an excerpt from, from the New Zealand Herald, where uh, the journalist Lincoln Tan is uh, talking about something similar, that some voters in Botany are scared to vote against the ruling party for fear of reprisal. Uh, but I, um, I, I think this, uh, this is an under-researched topic because there's, uh, I could find very, very little about it. And if, if this phenomenon exists, of course, this is a small sample and I can't generalize, but having, uh, having a lot of people, if there are a lot of people who are afraid to vote and don't believe uh, in the integrity of the electoral process, 
this is not good for democracy and uh, I, I think there should be some sort of voter education that will address uh, these fears. Um, uh, and yeah, so a gap. Uh, so I, I think that's a gap in both research and uh, education. Uh, now the second, the second fear was also interesting. That was a fear of losing face. Uh, so fear of going into the voting place and doing something wrong, showing incompetence in public. And this was something that was strong enough to stop some of my participants from voting. And uh, uh, internet voting was proposed as one of the solutions that would allow to, to, not, to not be exposed to, to this uh, public judgment uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the voting place. Uh, or another participant uh, here, that's the second quote, uh, proposed uh, wanted a guided environment, uh, like, like uh, on a plane where you've got a hostess and you let 30 people in at a time and uh, the hostess gives them very specific instructions what, uh, what to do. Uh, and uh, one party volunteer in Sweden complained that you can give people very, very detailed instruction and walk them to the entry of the voting place. Uh, and uh, as a party volunteer, you're not allowed to enter the voting place with them and they will lose all courage and uh, they, they will be still afraid. What if we do it wrong? Uh, and uh, I, I think that it's not always recognized how intense these feelings can be uh, because uh, uh, in, uh, I think in uh, both countries, native cultures, making an idiot out of yourself is something we do every day and we, we celebrate and we don't have much of an issue with, but uh, in, in, some, uh, in some cultures, and that was also uh, uh, a function of age among participants, older participants were more, more likely to express those feelings. Uh, it's, it's something that's very serious, so I, I, I think there needs to be more uh, structured, guided information or, or even voting practice where, where you go through this process. Uh, not, uh, not in theory, uh, you don't have, uh, because some, some, some of the materials the Electoral Commission publishes are, for example, migrants talking about how they voted, but uh, you're not showing the process and it's, it's the process that's the source of anxiety for some people. Uh, so that came up actually more in Sweden, which has a more complicated voting process uh, with three levels of elections happening at the same time. Uh, but also in New Zealand, some of the uh, election observers I uh, spoke to in, in migrant uh, ele in electorates with people walking into the voting place, looking around and walking out, just losing courage and, and not, not proceeding. Um, Um, okay, lack, lack of information was, uh, was the next theme, and you could say that this, this is kind of obvious, but uh, the details were, um, were interesting because uh, most of my participants were very well integrated uh, because the recruitment was, of course, voluntary. So they were people who speak the language of, of the host country, has been in the host country for a long time. Uh, have the right to vote and know it, uh, and uh, were, interest, were interested in this research enough to comment that there wasn't any, any sort of payment for participation. So, uh, so, so uh, these, these were people who, were, uh, who, who you could call by integrated, and so, some of them still said that they have no idea about politics and they don't, don't know anything, and here's uh, this uh, um, I've got those labels from groups, so this is a group of Asian professionals and, and uh, uh, this, this person uh, actually uh, is a corporate accountant, so, so uh, they, uh, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a high paid job, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a low socioeconomic uh, position, uh, but uh, she said that, you know, I understand the culture, social culture, but politics and what is the purpose of government? This is something we are still not fully aware of our, our family. Uh, so, so it was uh, it was really surprising uh, uh, how uh, how vast this lack of knowledge was among some participants. And one of my participants was in New Zealand for twenty years, has never seen the enrollment form before. Uh, she saw it the first time in in the focus group when, where, where this was one of the materials I used. Uh, so it was possible somehow to live in New Zealand for 20 years and never, uh, never have contact with 
uh, with, uh, with the enrollment form. Um, and uh, in, uh, in, in New Zealand, the, the voting process had uh, several moments that were sources of confusion to participants and, uh, and, and made participants more likely to give up on, on the whole thing. Uh, so, uh, Enrollment. Uh, by the way, in, in Sweden, voter enrollment is automatic from tax records, so you don't have to fill out any additional form like in New Zealand. Uh, so uh, uh, some participants uh, got sent the enrollment form, filled it out, and they thought they voted. And uh, it was only because I asked questions uh, about detailed questions about their voting experience, like uh, tell me how you voted, what were your feelings, what exactly happened, that I discovered that no, they didn't vote. They thought they voted, but what they did, uh, they filled out the enrollment form and, and sent it back to, to the address. Uh, and uh, uh, some, some uh, participants uh, also uh, didn't understand the enrollment form, such as the Maori option, and in, in one group, uh, uh, some participants believe that uh, the Maori option means that uh, Maori have um, the ability to vote for two. And there was a discussion about how this is unfair, and I was trying to explain to them the, uh, how, how the electoral system works. But uh, the inclusion of this Maori option on the electoral uh, uh, enrollment form without any additional uh, information was very, very confusing for, for some people. And, and so, so was the part where uh, uh, people are asked to uh, draw a map of where they reside. Of course, this is just for people who don't have uh, don't have a street address, which, which is a very small number of dwellings. Uh, but uh, this information is in small print and, and the instruction uh, draw a map of, of, uh, of your house is in, in larger print, it's in plain English. So some people uh, thought it was compulsory and they thought, you know, this is excessive. Why, why do I need to draw a map of, of my house? Like, who needs that and for what? And, and this uh, uh, contributed to those fears of uh, uh, you know, the, the, the government wanting to, to know too much about them. Uh, and uh, local government elections, which also are po postal, they were another source of confusion because some people also believe that they voted. Uh, uh, some people believe they voted for the president, uh, which I, I guess was the mayor. Uh, and uh, so, so there is a lot of uh, materials they received by posts, the enrollment form, uh, the local elections, and there's no one to explain it uh, to them. And uh, there's, um, and, oh, and also the uh, health boards. So, 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 uh, so in, in Sweden, it's, um, uh, it's the process inside the voting booth that's complicated because there are envelopes and you have to put the right ballot into the right of three envelopes. And uh, this is complicated, but this is, uh, in the voting place where there are people, uh, election, polling workers available to help you. Whereas in New Zealand, most of the confu uh, sources of confusion are outside of the voting place when, where there isn't anyone uh, to help uh, and to explain. And for most people, this is just not important enough to uh, look for information by themselves. So they, they said, we know it's all somewhere online, but we will not go and, uh, uh, and look it up. So the, there's a strong preference of uh, delivery that doesn't require efforts or so uh, uh, being uh, including it in some sort of introduction or mandatory introduction or uh, uh, English, those English classes they, they take at the site. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so this, uh, so my, uh, one of my recommendations uh, for New Zealand is that this data shows need for more, more voter education for new migrants. Uh, but also the, the Swedish case shows that uh, if you do voter education around it can contribute to alienation uh, and exclusion rather than inclusion. So uh, it's, it's very important uh, to, uh, to, to, to design the content and the ways of delivery well. And here I will go back to this, um, uh, to this um, quote. Uh, that's that's one, one of the Swedish participants commenting on uh, uh, on the social start on civics education in the migrant integration program in, in Sweden, uh, and uh, he, he points out that uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, program treats people as people who have voted when, when they have never voted and you can't start talking about policies of parties and is this party good for me or is this party good for me when people uh, don't really understand uh, democracy, they don't understand this fighting it out among equals uh, by the means of a vote rather than by other means. And uh, so, so uh, the Swedish uh, social studies classes, on, on one hand, they treat, uh, they treat participants as undereducated, as we have seen. Uh, but on the other hand, democracy is something so obvious uh, that you start education from talking about policies of different parties. Uh, and you don't even explain what it means that there are different parties and why are there different parties and how how does this work? Uh, so um, uh, education really should be based on uh, research that recognizes where people are coming from, what, what sort of uh, fears and what sources of confusion there are, so that this can be addressed. Uh, and also uh, uh, policy discourse is important. What, what is expected from the migrant? What is wanted from the migrant? Uh, how is this communicated? And uh, some participants in New Zealand uh, felt that uh, what's expected of them is only the economic contribution, uh, not uh, any other sort of contribution. Uh, and this also uh, contributed to the reluctance to get engaged in politics. Uh, and also using, using community languages is important, so that's, that's another uh, policy recommendation to use those languages more. Uh, and here, just to end with a quote, uh, it, uh, I, I, I spoke uh, a lot about information just now, but it, it comes back to belonging. And uh, uh, here, uh, this participants are saying that it's about the feeling and you, you can't educate that feeling. Uh, so uh, maybe all those informational uh, barriers could be overcome if people were enthusiastic enough to uh, about voting and belonging to uh, to tackle uh, these barriers by themselves and get educated. Um, okay, so I will now uh, um, open the floor for questions. Thanks very much. Um, very interesting uh, discussion and interesting comparative um, uh, perspectives in particular, I think. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll just um, throw open the, the floor for questions. Um, uh, maybe give the, the folks online an opportunity first, if you'd like to raise your hand or anyone here. Yep, Natalie. Yeah, hi, thanks. That was um, really interesting, especially the comparison between Sweden and New Zealand. Um, I, I've been interviewing, for my research, I've interviewed people um, from refugee backgrounds in New Zealand about this idea of belonging. And um, this idea of kiwiness came up quite a lot too. And for them, they felt very much part of New Zealand, but they didn't feel like other New Zealanders saw them as kiwis, or as real kiwis. Um, and I wondered whether there was, I know in your participants was a mixture of um, migrants and humanitarian entrants. And I wondered if there was a difference between how you came into New Zealand and or Sweden between those feelings of being accepted? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, my, uh, my Swedish participants were mostly from former refugee background. Uh, in my New Zealand sample, there were very few of them, which reflects the fact that it's a very small proportion. Uh, so, so, uh, the, uh, so I don't know if I can generalize based on this, but uh, yeah, one, one of these participants uh, also preferred online voting because then he wouldn't have to walk in the voting place and be seen vote, voting by other people because he wasn't sure if other people would want him, you know, making a decision about their government. So, uh, so yeah, there is, uh, uh, you, 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 you could count this as this awareness of how, how other people see you and, and, uh, and, and this perception that you are not, you, you feel, uh, belonging but others may not see it this way but uh, my, my research was focused in both cases on the dominant migrant group so i have very very little data from uh, uh, New Zealand migrants from former refugee backgrounds yeah so that's that's all i can say yeah. okay well, thanks yes yeah. <laughs> thanks other questions Thanks, Celestina. That was really interesting. I'm just wondering um, if you looked at or plan to look at um, 
a couple of other variables. I mean, looking at the, I think your second slide, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the countries of origin of the migrants, mm -hmm. one thing that really looked out at me was that the Swedish migrants, many of the countries had recent histories of very violent civil mm -hmm. conflict, whereas New Zealand, with the mm -hmm. New Zealand case, that was much less so. Mm -hmm. um, and the second issue, which is kind of tied into that, is are you looking at gender, uh, the issue of gender inequalities, particularly because in Sweden, mm -hmm. some of those countries are, are countries or cultures that, that gender equality is not a, not a, you know, mm -hmm. a high priority. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, so that's, um, uh, New Zealand and Sweden has, have, have different dominant sources of uh, migration or of, of uh, 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 post and voluntary migration. Uh, so, so the demographics of my participants reflected that. So, uh, so like you say, these were countries people are fleeing from because of the violence that's happening in these countries. Uh, I, I didn't focus specifically on on gender, but uh, gender came up in uh, some some of the discussions. So, uh, so in in some cases. Uh, uh, wives or partners, or female partners, were very dependent on their husbands in whether they vote or, or not. So, so my husband told me to, he, he went to vote, he told me to vote, so, so I went with him and voted. Uh, no, my, my husband doesn't vote, so I don't, uh, I, I don't, I, I didn't vote too, and I don't know anything about it. Uh, so, so there was this, uh, um, this dependence and it, it came it came from from women i i, I didn't uh, have the impression that men were trying to stop uh, the female family members from participating it was it was more uh, women's beliefs about uh, them being uh, having to follow their husbands in uh, or their fathers in, in what they do in terms of political participation was there any resistance to voting for female candidates from people from those more conservative cultures or at from any of the, the, the sample? Uh, I didn't uh, speak about uh, who they vote for, mm -hmm. only about participating. Right. Uh, so I, I didn't ask any questions that could reveal that. I see, Steve, thank you for that presentation. Mm. Some say that voting is um, a sort of a reflection of enlightened self interest. So you go vote for particular reasons, and usually these are self-interested reasons. Mm -hmm. So did you ever encounter anyone from your interviewees who said that he or she felt strongly to vote because the candidate spoke directly to him or her because there is a policy about immigration, for example, that's mm -hmm. on the table, and therefore he, he or she felt strongly mm -hmm. to go vote and vote for that particular uh, party? Mm -hmm. But I think that that, that makes uh, the whole game different. If there is a policy on immigration and it's part of the electoral campaign, and mm -hmm. then immigrants may therefore be more inclined mm -hmm. to participate and vote. Okay, a very interesting question. Thank you. So, not in New Zealand, and right? in, in Sweden, uh, in Sweden, there's a strong anti immigration party. And this was what mobilized politically some of my participants uh, to the extent that they not just voted but uh, signed up for memberships in other pa political parties. And, uh, and uh, for, for many of my participants, uh, this, uh, this party, the Swedish Democrats, was the first political party they learned about because that was the party that was against them and they were aware of it. And that was the, the, the point of entry into politics, just learning about this, this party and then reacting to it by, by getting engaged. Uh, but not in, but uh, my, my research was, uh, uh, it was before the 2017 election. So uh, I can't remember if there were any, if immigration was a big topic in the 2014 election, maybe if- uh, it was, yeah, 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 yeah particularly about foreign ownership, well, foreign ownership mm -hmm. and immigration mm -hmm. from one particular party, which I don't think you can easily <laughs> guess which one. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 no, no one, uh, uh, none of my participants in New Zealand mentioned, mentioned that. They, they mentioned housing policy, uh, so, uh, but, but not specifically migration policy. So none of them mentioned New Zealand First, even though obviously New Zealand First is nowhere near as radical as the Sweden Democrats, but it is still. Yeah, perceived yeah. as being anti-immigrant. 
yeah, but I, I, I think uh, Winston Peters didn't manage to mm. uh, become so well known among sure. my Well, about the fact that ACT obviously very clearly markets itself to the Chinese community. Mm -hmm. None of your respondents. No, but I, I avoided uh, my my, uh, uh, my interview guide didn't have questions about politicians and parties mm -hmm. because I, I wanted to keep it apolitical as as far as possible to um, uh, to get more participants because some participants uh, as it uh, was revealed uh, were afraid of uh, politics and discussing politics so uh, so my questions were about uh, about uh, uh, Voting and some some participants started talking about politicians and about the political views, but there wasn't any question uh, about it. So so there isn't consistent data across uh, across participants. Um, I, um, did did you look at uh, where the participants were getting the information from mm -hmm. about? how to vote or their reasons for voting. It seems like there's various beliefs or perceptions mm -hmm. that they're bringing on board and it's creating barriers for them to actually mm -hmm. go and vote. So did you look at the difference with discourses in, in the media or, or even just integration programs? Uh, other people, other people were the major source and people from within their community. Uh, so not, not the media and uh, uh, not uh, uh, not only the official sources. So, so if someone didn't understand, uh, for example, the enrollment form, they would take it to someone else from their community. And if this person also didn't know, they would start discussing and oh, what, what does the Maori option mean? And they would sometimes come to uh, the totally wrong conclusions. Uh, and uh, it was um, it was interesting because uh, uh, many uh, many of my participants would like to have more political discussion with uh, locals to, to learn about politics from them. Uh, and in, in New Zealand, uh, some participants said that there's occupational segregation, they, they don't really know any Kiwis, but those who worked with Kiwis complained, well, uh, yeah, complained that Kiwis don't talk about politics and you have to work really hard to extract any information about this from them. Uh, like asking who, who do you vote for, who do you think I should vote for, whereas in, in many, uh, for many uh, participants in their countries of origin that was a normal conversation that was happening at workplaces and in public places all the time. And this, this segregation was worse in Sweden because there's residential segregation uh, in, in Sweden and also this high unemployment among migrants. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so the, the, there, was, uh, there was a strong preference for getting this information from other people and in an interactive setting where you can discuss and ask questions to clarify whatever you don't know. And one participant said that, you know, I, I know it's all online and I can look it up, but I, I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing it because it's, uh, uh, that's that requires too too much too much effort. Yeah. If, if that's the case, because I, I had a similar question, I was sitting at one of their sources of information. If that's the case, then does that also raise other possibilities for the kinds of recommendations you, you might want to make? Because a lot of electoral information is directed at an individual mm -hmm. as an atomized subject who then makes learns everything about a mm -hmm. process and then makes mm -hmm. their own decisions. But I mean that might reflect the future particular political traditions as you're mm -hmm. implying here that don't involve wider sets of informal yeah. dialogue. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that imply there are other ways of, of engaging communities mm -hmm. as opposed to individuals um, in, in electoral processes? And how, what, that might, what might that look like? Yeah, definitely you should, uh, uh, this education should be directed at communities. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the important reasons is that those communities have different preconceptions. So for example, uh, this fear of uh, politics. It was specific to some communities, but not others. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, targeting communities rather than individuals and in an interactive setting, maybe community uh, meetings, workshops, festivals, uh, uh, and, and people actually wanted that. They wanted events. Uh, they, 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 uh, one, one person said, you know, we have uh, uh, 
people from the government coming here to South Auckland, talking to us about diabetes, uh, but no one is coming and talking to us about voting uh, in the same way. And we would say like that, but no, no, one, no one is doing it. And, and of course, it's a matter of cost. And I, I uh, spoke to employees of the Electoral Commission in Wellington, so, so they are aware of, uh, of this research and, and the findings. Uh, and uh, they would, of course, love to do more uh, voter education, uh, but they have very limited funding and they are also, uh, by law, they have to be because so, so it's, it's that they are walking a very thin line when, when they are delivering any sort of political, any sort of information to the voters. Because uh, if people start asking about political parties, then, uh, it, you know, someone who represents the uh, electoral commission cannot really say anything that would not be totally neutral, which, which is very difficult to do. So, so uh, uh, the, the, the whole structure, institutional structure in New Zealand is, is not very, uh, it's not, not very conducive to this sort of delivery. And uh, uh, in, in, in Sweden, uh, actually what, what is helping this delivery to communities is that uh, political parties are getting more funding from the government and uh, it's not earmarked so they are they can do with it whatever they want and some of them are using it to reach out to communities and of course this is campaigning but this is long-term campaigning such as having an NGO that's affiliated uh, to a party in a migrant neighborhood and uh, providing space for children to do homework with volunteers and parents at the same time are having tea with volunteers and volunteers start discussing politics with them like slowly and gently and, and this is a long-term strategy but it's possible only because of this funding structure that uh, uh, puts uh, more money into the hands of political parties. Uh, in, in New Zealand political parties only get active uh, during the election campaign, not, uh, not, not much, uh, there isn't much activity, much outreach to, to these communities uh, outside of uh, that period as far as I understand. New Zealand has one of the most liberal voting regimes in the world. You only have to live here 12 months mm -hmm. to, to, to vote. How does Sweden compare? Do you need to be a citizen or a permanent mm -hmm. resident or what's the situation there? Okay, so in, in Sweden you get uh, voting rights after five years of residence, so that's why uh, this uh, uh, requirement of having lived at least five years mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in the host country. Uh, but if you are a refugee from a country where the government collapsed and cannot provide you with documents such as birth certificate, as in the case of Somalia, this can stretch out to eight years. Right. So that was one of those quotes that, you know, you, you learn everything in those social studies classes at first, but then you wait eight years and you forget it. And, and this is an, like an insult, uh, like you, you can't participate for so long. Uh, and uh, in, in Sweden, uh, uh, you get uh, voting rights in local elections much much quicker than that. And there's also uh, a shorter time uh, for national voting rights for people from Nordic countries. So, so you have this po po policy is just uh, segregating people into you no know, groups we want to uh, allow to vote quicker and, and groups that we want to like, we need a longer time to, uh, to become uh, uh, eligible to vote. And this, this is also contributing to the sense of exclusion among uh, some of the participants were aware of these differences. Which used to be the case in New Zealand until I think about 30 years ago, British subjects could get the right to vote much sooner than people mm -hmm. who are not from Commonwealth countries. Yeah, so, so New Zealand has one of the most, if not the most liberal voting regimes in the world. And that was, that was really appreciated by many of the participants. Uh, but uh, some of them also felt like overwhelmed, like, oh, you know, after one year, you can't really uh, know the country well enough to, to vote. So that's, that's why I recruited people who uh, have been uh, in New Zealand for at least five years. To Particularly in comparison to Australia, which is, you know, when people are looking to immigrate to New Zealand, is obviously often the alternative. You have to be a citizen in Australia, mm -hmm. and that can be quite a long and expensive process to become a citizen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in your Sweden case, um, how many, what proportion of migrants are economic migrants? Uh, very few. Uh, so there were, uh, all, all my uh, economic migrants were uh, uh, partners of, were, were female partners of Swedes who came to, who, who met Swedes and came to, because uh, EU migrants were excluded. Uh, 
I, I didn't take it. I can some other countries from the European Union who can come to Sweden without visas because they are coming from a similar political system. So that's why they were not of interest. So my Swedish uh, participant group were, was overwhelmingly uh, people from former refugee backgrounds. So there were, I think, only three participants were economic migrants. Martha, you had a question. We can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? I think I was talking to my microphone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Celestina. I'm sorry I arrived late. I'm just down in Dunedin. Um, I'm very interested. I was. I love the quote where the woman said um, they were speaking because it's in my language. I feel like I belong, and I thought that is a wonderful uh, sort of a trigger point for further research because, of course, it shows us that um, inclusion creates feelings of belonging, but, um, but that will have impacts on the rest of the community. And so I just um, wondered if that came up with other participants. Uh, you mean the language issue? Or, uh, the... It was more when the woman who said, I speak English and I read English, but when I saw the instructions in Thai, then uh, I think it was about donating blood, then I felt closer to the Kiwi, ki Kiwis. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so uh, yes, so that's, um, uh, so this, this was a sentiment that was really reflected uh, among uh, a lot of participants, especially uh, from Asian countries. Uh, and uh, yeah, this, uh, this means that uh, if, if we wanted to implement this, this recommendation to have more uh, migrant languages used in the public space, it, it would affect uh, uh, it would affect this public space also for Kiwis. Uh, and uh, well, talking to Kiwis about it was not part of my research, so I, I, I'm not sure uh, what, what the reaction uh, would be. And, and there's also the issue of the terreo, and we don't want to crowd out uh, the Maori language. So, so this, this, this is a very interesting topic for, for research, and there are different, uh, uh, different considerations here. Uh, but one, uh, another interesting quote I had about languages was uh, one, uh, uh, one, one group was uh, almost offended that their language is not featured on the Electoral Commission website. They, they have a number of languages there uh, and, uh, and they were like, why, why is our language not there when the language of this neighboring country and this neighboring country are there? And uh, I said, well, it's probably the size of the community and I don't know how, how they are doing it, but it's this, this symbolic, uh, uh, so this symbolic representation and the symbolic inclusion was very, uh, very uh, important. And uh, I, I think uh, as, as far as uh, uh, materials on the internet go, you, you can do it discreetly so that it doesn't really change much for people who, uh, for, for Kiwis who don't speak those other languages. Uh, but in, in terms of public spaces and like signage in uh, voting places, yeah, that's, that's a different story and that's, that's of course a very interesting topic and I, I hope someone will uh, research it. Well, I think there's no further questions. We're coming up to 12 o'clock um, and so um, I think I might draw things to a close. I would just mention that um, uh, we have another uh, Migration Research Network seminar on the 26th of April. I don't have my timetable on me, Jess. Do you can yeah. you the, the name and topic for the 26th of April? Yes, by yes. we've got David Hall speak about fair borders, so it should be very oh. interesting. Right, right, right. So, so David Hall from the from AUT University, um, fair borders. So we'll draw on the book that he co-edited and published um, last year with Bridget Williams' books. So um, that'd be an interesting follow-on, and in, in a way, in some ways, uh, uh, to the talk we've had today. Um, so, so just before we leave, I just ask people to, to thank Philistina for for a um, great talk and, and for the dialogue that you've all brought afterwards.